Because of the installation this morning, I thought we would take some time to reflect a little bit together on what it means to be called as a leader of this church. So our text for this morning will be from 1 Timothy chapter 3, where we're going to be reading verses 1 through 13, and in your few Bibles, that can be found on page 1,244. Now, from the very beginning, of this, uh, one of the things that I want to make abundantly clear is that although this message will be most applicable to a certain people, it doesn't rule out the rest of us. And I'll make that clear near the end of my sermon, but I don't want to lose everybody from the very beginning thinking, well, this is a sermon for six people this morning and that you're not included. Know that you indeed are, and I'll highlight that near the end of our text. So again, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. This is Paul writing to his fellow worker, Timothy, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach. The husband above one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle. Not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Deacons, likewise, are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then, if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives are to be women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be the husband of but one wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in the faith in Christ Jesus. That's where we're going to end our reading for this morning. I imagine it's true for many of those who are in this congregation, but I've been on both sides of the hiring process. There have been times when I'm looking for a job, and, and when I'm looking for a job and I go in to apply for that job, there's a couple of things that I want to know. I want to know well, what does this job entail and am I able to do the things that are asked of me? And then once I figure that out, what I want to know also is, well, how much is this job going to pay me? What are the benefits? What are the rewards that I'm going to get from undertaking this job? If you're on the hiring side of things, it's basically the same questions, but just in reverse. You want to know that the person who you're, uh, who's applying understands the responsibilities that they're being hired for and is able to undertake them. And then knowing that, you hope that they're going to be responsible, reliable, and trustworthy in the exercise of that work. On both sides of the coin, you only get a, a little bit of time to figure these things out. But when it goes good, it can have a wonderful impact for a long time on your business and on your work and on your, yourself. And when it goes bad, it can have devastating consequences and a long-lasting impact uh, far beyond even the business. Well, in the book of 1 Timothy, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to his younger fellow servant, Timothy. At this time, Timothy wasn't going around uh, serving and, and planting churches with Paul as he'd done in the past. Instead, he was staying in Ephesus and had been sent to Ephesus, a city where the church existed, that previously the book of Ephesians had been written to, and he was there to help them deal with some things. And when we go to the beginning of the book, we see in 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 7, that one of the main things that Timothy was supposed to address, and the reasons why Paul was writing this letter, was the fact that there were some issues with church leadership. There were some people that had appointed themselves as teachers in the church, and yet the things that they weren't teaching were not consistent at all with the Christian faith. 
And so instead of leading the church well, they were causing conflict and discord. And as a result, Paul tells Timothy to command these men not to teach false doctrines any longer. Well, as you can imagine and hopefully are are aware of, when the early apostles were going out, like Paul, planting churches in different places, they would go and start a church. But then when they moved on, they needed people to lead that church, to lead it well, to guide it, to help continue to establish it, to study the word of God together and to apply that to each other's lives, holding each other accountable and encouraging each other in the growth of their faith. And again, when that went well, when well, good leaders rose up, you'd have servants like Timothy who were reliable, trustworthy, and could go and, and do that work well. But when it went poorly, as was happening in Ephesus, you had problems. And so Paul not only tells Timothy, you got to negatively get rid of these guys, tell them to stop teaching, but then he goes on to positively explain to him the kind of people he should be looking for and those that should be fulfilling these, respons- these roles with responsibility. And that's exactly what we get in chapter 3 of the text, uh, our text that we read this morning, chapter 3, 1 through 13. Now, when I talked about looking for a typical job, One of the most important things, as I mentioned, is understanding the roles and the responsibilities. What's the job description? What am I responsible for and what's outside of my my scope of responsibility? So if you bring that question to this text, then what is it that elders or overseers do? And what is it that deacons do? What do we find in this text about the job description that these roles entail? And when you try to answer that question from this text, you realize that actually it doesn't say anything about their job descriptions. Now, to a certain extent, the job description is found in those job titles themselves. In this text, it uses the word overseer. In other parts of the New Testament, that word overseer and elder are used synonymously and in the same context. And it's clear that they're talking about the same role, the same type of people. But in that word overseer, you understand some of their responsibilities. They are appointed to take care of the work of the church, to make sure that it's functioning properly, to make sure that the teachings are undergoing well, to hold one another accountable, and to make sure that the church is being what the church is supposed to be. We have a similar thing with the term deacon. That term literally means servant in Greek. And that's the job description that they get. They are there to serve the church in whatever capacity they can. But again, if you want to expand beyond that in terms of a job description, very little to nothing is said about what they are supposed to do. Instead of worrying about that, What does our passage focus on? And what does it emphasize when it comes to those that are to fulfill the role? And clearly, the emphasis is not on what they are supposed to be doing, but who is supposed to be doing these things, who these people are, and their character. That's what Paul wants Timothy and the Ephesian church to look at and to pay attention to. And that is where the focus of our text is. So when talking about an overseer or an elder and what, who they should be, Paul lists some 14 different things. And I'll go through them very quickly. They must be above reproach, a, a broad generalization to start with, not meaning they're sinless people, but they're at least morally careful. They must be the husband of one wife, which has less to say that they have to be married, or less of a comment about polygamy, but it's more of a comment about a demonstrated faithfulness within their lives, especially their family lives. They are to be temperate, not given to extremes or overindulgences in general. They are to be self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, willing to share their resources and things to make other people feel welcome and blessed with their gifts and talents. They have to be able to teach They have to have an understanding of the basics of the gospel and be able to share that basics with others so that they can learn more about God. They are not to be given over to drunkenness. They should always be trusted to be clear-headed and clear-minded. Not violent, but gentle. They're not supposed to punch people. (laughs) 
not quarrelsome, never looking to start an argument, but instead to be peacemakers, not lovers of money. If they're going to be entrusted with the responsibilities of other people's finances, they have to be free from that temptation to misuse those finances or find ways to, to get those finances for themselves. He must manage his own family well. And Paul explains this one, saying that if you are the head of your household, and if you don't do that well, if you can't confront your children's downfalling, well then, how are you going to be able to confront the downfalling and failure of those who are within the church of God? He must not be a recent convert. Now here too, Paul explains this one, and you would imagine that he shouldn't be a recent convert because he doesn't know enough yet, and his knowledge is insufficient, so he should wait. When in reality, again, the concern is not knowledge, the concern is character. If they're a recent convert, they might be given into the temptation of pride or conceit. Look at me, I've only been in this church a short amount of time, and already they've called me a leader. I must be good. Paul says, be wary of that. They also must have a good reputation with outsiders. And this says a few things. It says that they should be respected both inside and outside of the church, as well as a reminder of the fact that people are indeed watching. They're paying attention to the actions and behavior of these leaders, and so they have to have a good reputation. And we'll expand on that a little bit more in just a bit. So then after making such a list for the elders, now we have a list of the, the kind of person that should be able to apply for the job of deacon. And here again, we have another set of characteristics. They are to be men worthy of respect. Again, with the judgment of their character from people around them, it should be generally positive. They should be sincere. They should not be indulging in much wine. Again, clear-headedness. They are not to pursue dishonest gain. If you're going to trust them with money especially, they should uh, be able to be honest in their pursuit of how to handle those money. They must hold to the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. This one needs a little bit more explanation. One of the differences, even though many of these things are repeated between the two lists, is that the elders are said that they have to be able to teach. That's not included in the deacon's list. Instead, what it is saying is that they have to hold to the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. Which means that they have to have an understanding of the gospel. And that understanding of the gospel needs to make a difference in the way that they live their lives. That they've been changed, that they've been shaped by the good news of what Christ has done for them. And they have to live that out in a clear conscience. They must first be tested. Somewhat similar to the idea that they should have time to mature as Christians. They should approve themselves worthy as leaders. Next, Paul goes on to address their wives. Now, first of all, we have to be honest that this is a bit of an interpretation. The word there is just their women, um, and some use that to mean other things, but in the context, wives seem to be the most applicable uh, translation. And it says that the wives who stand by their side, who might be privy to some of the things that they're working to with, they too have to be people of good character as they support their husbands in their work, as they hear about things that are going on, they too have to be trustworthy. And finally, we have the reputation and the call again to be husbands of one wife, a manager of his children and his household. So what do we learn in general from looking at these two lists? Well, first of all, we learn about what the church needs. The church needs men of good character who can be both good teachers, but more importantly, can be positive role models for the church and what it means to live out and in light of the gospel in every day of your life. They are to be people that can be trusted and relied upon, that they are always there willing and able to serve, that they be governed by their relationship with God by nothing else. That's the priority in who they are. Not money, not gain, not uh, honor and privilege and pride, but instead about service to God. In fact, that's what a lot of what this list boils down to. Someone who will serve the church. Not asking, what is in this for me, but how am I called to use what God has given me toward others? It's the acknowledgement that when you are put in a leadership position anywhere, but especially 
in the church, that people are watching. People both inside the church and outside of it. And most of those people are watching to understand what does it mean to be a a Christian of good character and to lead well. But there are those who are also be watching for those slip ups, for those mistakes to say, see, they're no better than anybody else. And the Christian followers are just hypocrites. And sadly, as Paul has already experienced in Ephesus, we too have seen what can happen When people are in leadership positions and they fail to live up to these standards. At the very least, they can cause seasons of conflict and divisions and all kinds of strife. And at the worst, they can have generations of impact causing divisions and even driving people away from the faith. Rather than calling them to a relationship with Christ. So Paul says to Timothy in Ephesus... In knowing that, we really need to be careful in the kinds of people that we put in leadership positions. Don't worry so much about their skills and their ability. Worry about their character and who they are. But then that gets to us today and how we hear this message and what we're supposed to do with it. So let me address a couple of different audiences as we listen to this message this morning. First, let me address, obviously, those six men that stood up this morning and the 12 others, myself included, that they will be joining as official, officially ordained leaders of this church. If you're like me, you read over a whole list of these character traits and you review it, and you wonder if you're really worthy of a job that you've just gotten yourself into. You think, uh, sure, there's a couple of things that I do okay with most of the time on this list, but, but all of them, all of the time, I I don't know if we should have interviewed my children before giving me this job and how good of a parent I am in this different role. But, But let me start by actually encouraging that level of somewhat fear and examination. This is a serious role that you are being called to, and we should be really concerned about our abilities to live into these roles. But instead of letting that concern drive us out of and away from these leadership positions, instead what they need to do is drive us into a deeper relationship with and dependence upon the God who called us to them. Because I can't do any of these things on my own, because I can never live up to that list of 14 positive character traits, what I need to do is instead depend upon God, pray that he guide me through all of this so that we can be the leaders he's called us to be. Again, if you look earlier in the book of Timothy in chapter 1, right after talking about the problems that we're having with these, these poor teachers, Paul takes a moment to reflect upon his own leadership and his calling. And this is that famous text where Paul says that this is a trustworthy saying, that Jesus Christ came to save sinners, of which I am the worst. And Paul admits that his background and his history is full of problems that would have disqualified him for leadership. But instead of running from the leadership and responsibilities, instead he sees that as a testimony of the power of the gospel to change a life. And he celebrates the fact that even someone like him could be used by God to do great things. If God could use someone as awful as Paul way back then, and if God could use someone even as bad as I am to help lead this church, that's the testimony of the gospel. That God can use sinners to build his kingdom and serve his church. So yes, worry about your character. Feel the weight of the responsibility of all of these different character traits, but let that weight drive you into prayer, into a closer relationship with God and dependence upon him. But that still leaves the other 95% of you. Does this text have anything to say to you, or do you just get to say, well, phew, I'm glad I don't have that responsibility. I get to do whatever I want instead. And the answer is, of course not on a number of different levels, and let me explain how. First of all, this morning we had six people stand before us. Next year we're going to have at least five more, and those five more are going to be coming from among you. Those people don't just come out of nowhere. 
And already now, even though you may not be in a position of leadership, those who one day may be called, either whether it be next year or you're a young person who it could be 20 years down the road from today, you should already be developing these positive character traits, putting yourself in opportunities to serve well so that you can be a blessing to God's church whether you're called to official position or not. We need to train up and raise up leaders. And you should be developing these character traits even now. And that is also for those not only in a, uh, official ordained positions, but anyone who has a title or a responsibility of any leadership within this church. If you are a small group leader, a Sunday school teacher, a nursery attendant, an upper room counselor, a gems leader, cadet counselor, a praise team member, and on and on and on. We do expect that if you're going to lead anyone in this church, you should lead well. You should be a person of good character who others can look to as an example and a model of the Christian faith. So all of us should hear that. In fact, in light of that, and in light of the fact that the world is watching all of us at all times, whether or not we've been put in a position, leader, position of leadership at all, all of us at all times should be striving to live up to this kind of a character. And I'm justified in saying this because except for that statement of the elders or overseers should be able to teach, all of these other characteristics at some point are given to general Christians at other times in the, in the scriptures, in the Bible. All Christians are called to be hospitable. All Christians are called to be temperate. All Christians are called to be under self-controlled, trustworthy, and on and on and on. So yes, our leaders need to be especially concerned about these things, if for no other reason for the, the greater impact that their leadership rules put in a, in a their leadership roles put onto a community. But that doesn't let the rest of us off the hook. All of us should always be aware of the fact that our lives, our actions, our choices are a living demonstration of the impact of the gospel upon our lives. And if we don't live with good character, we give the world the excuse to say, well, the gospel is meaningless. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't change anything. When instead, when they look at us, they should be seeing people who live out and exemplify these characters. And where God has worked and changed us, may that be a cause for celebration and praise. And where we continue to struggle, may we, through prayer and reliance on the Holy Spirit, continue to look to God for help. There would be no greater shame that I could know of that because of our actions, someone walked away from a relationship with Jesus Christ, judging God by us. But that also means that there could be no greater responsibility and greater joy to be able to be used by God to be a positive light within this world, a good example to others that they might follow and allow his kingdom to grow. So once again, for those six men that stood up today and the other 12 that have officially ordained titles of leadership in this church, we know that burden. So we again pledge to you our prayers and our support. We believe that in you getting called to this responsibility and this, this work, that we've recognized in you character traits that God has affirmed in his calling you to this task, and therefore he will sustain you as you undertake it. And for the rest of us, may we too always seek to be the kind of people that anyone at any time would be able to look to and understand that we live lives that are changed by the gospel changed by the truth that Jesus Christ died for my sins and rose again from the grave to give me hope of eternal life, but also call me to a new life here and now. May that be what all people see in all of us at all times. Toward that end, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we sit amongst you a whole host of people that know that if we even look at this past week or the past few days of our lives, we've fallen far short of the, the call that you have given to us, not only to leaders, but to all of us. And I do pray again that we would hear that call and with the help of your Holy Spirit that we would continue to strive to, to give a positive example of the change uh, that your good news makes in our lives. 
I do pray that we would never drive anyone away from a relationship with you because of our failings. But I pray that we would serve you and bless others around us, both inside the church and outside. Lord, again, I especially pray that for those that you have called to leadership within this church. It is indeed a noble task. And while it feels like an intimidating task, and there are many snares that are bound around it, I do pray that you would keep all of our church's leaders pure, dedicated to you, and may they be wonderful examples of what it means to be those who serve you and live for you in every area of life. Lord, we cannot do this of our own strength or ability, and so I do pray that your Holy Spirit would be poured out upon this whole church, blessing us as we seek to serve you each and every day of our lives in everything we do so that your name can be glorified and honored and praised in all of the work of this church and all of its members. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.